Golden Man, El Dorado. When Christopher Columbus sailed west from Spain in 1492, he was trying to reach the Spice Islands, which today are called Indonesia. Spices were very scarce and valuable in Europe at this time. No one knew that two vast oceans and the American continents lay between Europe and Asia. Columbus did not find spices in America, but he did bring home some gold trinkets. The American Indians wore these as jewelry. Gold, not spices, was to become the biggest motive for exploration. Expeditions into the interior of the Americas were very costly and very risky. Only by promising the authorities huge profits could sailors and soldiers raise money for their expeditions. They also needed to promise rich rewards in order to get followers and crews. If a leader returned to Europe without gold and jewels, he might end up in jail. No wonder the Spanish conquerors were always searching for gold. At first, the Spaniards stayed around the coasts of the Caribbean Sea, but stories of gold in the interior tempted them to explore inland. They asked the Indians where their gold jewelry came from. The Indians would point further inland. They said that a wealthy people lived in the high mountains that traded gold and emeralds for pearls, cotton, and shells. The Spanish emperor had given the rights to exploit present-day Venezuela and Colombia to his German bankers in 1528. So Germans Dalfinger, Featherman, and Hohermuth led a series of expeditions into the jungles, grasslands, and mountains. Meanwhile, Spanish conquerors had found immense riches in gold and silver. Hernando Cortez had captured the kingdom of the Aztecs in Mexico in 1519. He had sent immense treasures to Europe. Soon after this, Francisco Pizarro began to explore the west coast of South America. In 1531, Pizarro invaded Peru and destroyed the kingdom of the Incas. Pizarro melted down the gold and silver treasures of the Incas and sent gold and silver bricks back to Spain. The rush to find more gold became very heated. Rumors came down from the mountains of Colombia about a golden man. El hombre dorado. There were stories about a king so rich that he wore gold dust instead of a coat. Colombia was the kingdom of the Chipchas. They were a trading people who traded salt and emeralds for gold, cotton, pearls, and shells. The actual gold did not come from their kingdom. It was found in the mountain rivers and brought to the Chipchas for refining and metalwork. Several armies converged on Chipcha territory. The first to arrive was the Spaniard Quesada, coming up the Magdalena River from the Caribbean. He found the chief cities of the Chipchas and seized their gold and emeralds. Shortly afterwards, one of Pizarro's captains arrived from Peru and Ecuador. Then the German Featherman arrived from Venezuela. Quesada gave the latecomers some gold and jewels to ease their disappointment. Casada's men also found out about the Golden Man. High in the mountains was a lake created by a meteorite. The Indians believed that the Golden God from the sky now lived at the bottom of the lake. When a new leader of the tribe was elected, he was covered in grease, and fine gold dust was blown over his body so that he appeared to be made of gold. He was taken out to the middle of the lake on a raft. He would jump into the lake and stay in the water till the gold dust was washed off. It was considered an offering to the god. Gold ornaments were also tossed in the lake. Then the king and his followers would return to the shore. The ceremony was stopped several generations before the Europeans arrived. Many people were unwilling to believe that this was the whole story. They began to search for a golden city hidden in the jungle. Many explorers perished in this search. In their search for gold, the Spanish conquerors destroyed the great Indian civilizations of America. Towns and villages had been ruined. Thousands of people killed, and wonderful pieces of art melted down. Some Indians believed that gold must be a food that Europeans desperately needed to stay alive. In many cases, the Europeans destroyed the trading and social systems that had produced their wealth. When we think about the great achievements of a few conquerors and explorers, we are also sad about how much death and damage they caused. Medical missionary. During the reign of Queen Victoria, 1837 to 1901, British people traveled around the whole world. They charted the seas, mapped out distant countries, and studied plants, animals, and people. They also claimed many lands for England. This kind of international travel was made easier by improved transportation and communication. New inventions such as steamships, trains, telegraphs, and telephones made long distances seem smaller. Of course, people had different reasons for going to distant lands. 
Some were businessmen who saw economic opportunities overseas. Soldiers wanted fame and a chance to enlarge the British Empire. Big game hunters wanted to be the first to shoot strange animals and bring back trophies to England. Scientists intended to study unknown animals and plants. Missionaries planned to be the first to introduce Christianity to faraway people. In 1836, a young Scotsman called David Livingstone began to study medicine in Glasgow. Livingstone intended to become a medical missionary. This means that he would be a doctor as well as a preacher and teacher. Livingstone, 1813 to 1873. Came from a poor family. From an early age, he had worked 14 hours a day in a clothing factory for very little pay. But he was determined to learn. He took his books with him to the factory and read as he worked. Then, after work, he would go to his teacher to learn more. Livingston's goal was to teach faraway people about Jesus. However, unlike some missionaries, he was also interested in science, geography, and exploring. He had planned to go to China in 1839, but because of the Opium Wars, no missionaries were being sent there. Instead, he asked to go to South Africa. Europeans had traveled around the coasts of Africa for hundreds of years, but very few white people had traveled inland. A missionary named Robert Moffat, who had begun a mission at Kuriman in the interior, inspired Livingston. Livingston arrived in Kuriman in 1841. This was the farthest outpost of white settlement, and no one seemed to want to go further inland. Livingston felt that the missionaries should go to the Africans rather than waiting for the Africans to come to them. With a fellow missionary, he set out. When they came to an African tribe, they would talk to the chief and ask permission to preach to his people. Livingston would also set up a tent and treat the people who had diseases. After a while, he would move on to the next tribe. Once Livingston learned the Bantu language, he would talk to many Africans. But sometimes he needed interpreters. There were many diseases, including malaria and sleeping sickness. Livingston suffered much of his life from river fever. He was also so weak that he rode on the back of an ox. Livingston wanted to stop the slave trade. At this time, the slave trade was the most profitable business in Africa. Livingston hoped that if other kinds of trade were developed, then slavery could be abolished. In order to open up trade, he wanted to find an easy route into the center of Africa. Livingston kept going further into the interior. He was probably the first European to cross the Kalahari Desert before reaching Lake Ngami in present-day Botswana. Not long after, he traveled further inland. He explored the sources of the Zambezi and Kansai rivers, and eventually reached the west coast of Africa and Luanda, Angola. Livingston was being criticized for neglecting missionary work in order to explore. Livingston replied that he was opening up the continent for missionaries. Meanwhile, he was becoming famous as a great explorer. The British government commissioned him to explore the Zambezi River. They hoped that ships could sail up the river into the interior. Unfortunately, the Zambezi had too many rapids. However, Livingston did find a route up the Shire River to Lake Nyasa. He continued to struggle against the slave trade, which is now being taken over by Arabs. Livingston died in Africa in 1873. He was the first white man to explore Botswana, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Malawi, and surrounding areas. He was not only a great explorer, but also a fine doctor and a good missionary. Nowadays, the countries that Livingston visited are nearly all Christian, just as he had hoped they would be. Harriet Tubman. Before the American Civil War, the economy of the Southern states was based on the use of slave labor. The social and political leaders of the Old South were the plantation owners. Many of these owned hundreds of black slaves. The slaves were mainly used to pick crops like cotton and tobacco. Harriet Tubman was born in 1820 in the state of Maryland. As a girl of seven, she was sent into the fields to work with the adult slaves. The slaves worked from sunrise to sunset picking the crops. Often they sang songs while they worked. 
slaves were not taught to read or write. It was feared that reading and writing would help slaves to escape the plantations. Harriet Tubman was illiterate. Later in life, when she was in danger of being captured, she picked up a book and pretended to read it. This fooled the bounty hunters. When she was fifteen, Harriet helped another slave to escape. The overseer was so angry with her that he hit her over the head with an iron weight. Harriet was knocked unconscious for many days. All the rest of her life, she suffered from headaches and sudden sleeping spells. Harriet escaped from the plantation to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Since Pennsylvania was not a slave state, Harriet was fairly safe there. She was able to return secretly to the plantation and bring the rest of her family to freedom. There were already people working to bring black slaves up from the South to freedom. These people, both white and black, used the language of the railroad. Escaped slaves were called passengers. Safe houses were called stations. And the guides were called conductors. Harriet soon became a conductor in the Underground Railway. In 1850, the American government passed a second Fugitive Slave Act. This put more pressure on northern states to return escaped slaves to the South. Because of this, the Underground Railway went further north to Canada. In 1793. Upper Canada, Ontario, had passed a law bringing a gradual stop to slavery. In 1834, slavery was abolished in the whole British Empire. A lot of escaped slaves had come to Canada before 1850, but now nearly all escaped slaves tried to go there. Harriet Tubman rented a house in St. Catharines, Ontario. This provided a shelter for new arrivals. Harriet made about eleven trips from Canada to the U.S. during these years. In all, she brought back about three hundred people. Escaped slaves had to travel by night and suffered hardships in bad weather. They had to hide during the day wherever they could. Harriet did not allow any passengers to turn back. That might endanger the whole underground railway. When the slave owners heard about Harriet, they offered a reward for her capture, but no one caught her or turned her in. When the Civil War broke out in 1861, she acted as a spy for the Northern States. After the war, she married a black American soldier, Nelson Davis. In 1869, a book was written about Harriet Tubman. Black slaves knew Harriet as Moses. The Bible tells this story. Of how Moses led the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt, he led them north to Palestine. In the same way, Harriet Tubman delivered many of her people from slavery and led them north to freedom. The Internet. The first working computers in the 1950s and 1960s were large mainframe machines. In some ways, they were like large calculating machines. The U.S. government, the military, and businesses and institutions used them for specific tasks. For example, they might be used to handle the payroll. As more uses were found for computers, the need to transfer data from one computer to another became a concern. In 1969, the U.S. government sponsored a program to explore ways for computers to transfer data over telephone lines. The first internet was created with four computers linked together. Of course, computer use increased beyond anyone's expectations. Standards were developed that describe how data was to be transferred between computers. A common language for commands and communications emerged. Operating programs such as MS DOS, Unix, Macintosh, and Windows came into existence. The internet quickly expanded beyond government and military uses. The PC became the standard form of computer. Private agencies acted as hosts for internet usage. Around 1982, there were 213 hosts. By 1986, there were 2,300. Today, there are millions. The role of computers expanded so quickly that the USSR, which had discouraged computer use, found itself left behind by the USA. Part of the reason for the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989 was that they had fallen too far behind the United States in high-tech areas to ever catch up.
One of the most popular uses of the computer is electronic mail or email. You can send a letter by computer over the internet to anywhere in the world in seconds or less, and it doesn't cost anything extra. Now data can be transferred great distances almost instantaneously. Another major internet use is the World Wide Web. In the early days, all web pages were text only. In the 1990s, it became possible to make web pages interactive and multimedia. Interactive means that readers could click on items on the web page and get more information. They could also communicate directly with the web page owner. Multimedia means that web pages were no longer text only. They could also have graphics, film, video, and audio. This has helped to turn computers into popular entertainment. Nowadays, people spend hours every day surfing the net. However, there are some problems. For some people, computers are addictive. Many businesses are trying to control employees using the net during working hours. Since the internet includes just about every kind of information, not all of it is good. You can find directions on how to become a criminal or a terrorist. There are scam artists who want to cheat you out of money. There are also aggressive. Pornography salesmen, not to mention people who want to kill your computer with viruses. Since the internet is not closely regulated, it's up to individual users to follow computer etiquette. Parents need to supervise their children's use of the net. Although the internet has some disadvantages, many people see the net as one of the greatest invention of modern times. Charlie Brown. On October second, nineteen fifty, a new comic strip appeared in American newspapers. The hero of the strip was a round-headed kid named Charlie Brown. In the very first cartoon, two young schoolmates watch Charlie Brown walking by, and one comments, "Well, here comes old Charlie Brown. Yes, sir, good old Charlie Brown. How I hate him." This comic strip was to become one of the most popular in history. Its creator, Charles M. Schultz, drew the strip for fifty years until his death. But reruns of Peanuts still appear regularly in the newspaper. What are some of the characteristics of Charlie Brown and his friends that have made the cartoon popular? Charlie Brown is an unlikely hero. Other kids don't like being around him because the things he does never seem to work out properly. Kids want to be with someone who's good-looking, popular, and successful, so they can feel part of his success. Charlie Brown is always worrying, hardly ever upbeat, afraid of failure, and always making mistakes. His kite gets snagged in the tree. He needs counseling from Lucy. His dog Snoopy is more popular than he is, and the little red-haired girl never notices him. In short, Charlie Brown is a loser. Charlie Brown illustrates all the insecurities that kids have. Many of these anxieties carry over into adult life. Sometimes they reflect problems in the life of the comic strip's creator, Charles M. Schultz. Schultz suffered from depression much of his life and had a difficult time in school. He was not very popular with his classmates. Humor and laughter are often a way of dealing with problems. And in the Peanuts strip, the world can laugh at all the silly things that people do. Because of his honest way of dealing with problems, Charlie Brown and his friends are more interesting than the average comic strip characters. The characters represent adult personality types. Charlie Brown is wishy-washy and is afraid to do things for fear of failure. Lucy is a pushy, overbearing female who thinks she knows it all. Linus, her younger brother, is intellectual but insecure. He still clings to his baby blanket for security. Schroeder is preoccupied with Beethoven's music to the exclusion of everything else. Sally, Charlie Brown's younger sister, combines both a romantic attachment to Linus and a desire for material things. Peppermint Patty is a tomboy who loves baseball, but nonetheless has a romantic crush on Charlie Brown. Snoopy, the dog, represents a cool, detached, inventive individual who also relies on basic creature comforts. These characters add up to a human comedy. In the comic strip, we can see ourselves and the people around us making mistakes, getting second chances, but tending to do the same things over again. Behind the humor of Peanuts. Is a serious message. Words can hurt. Relationships are important. Truth is difficult to find. Criticism is too common. Greed can easily overpower us. These messages are both timeless and timely. Peanuts has also been turned into television specials and several movies. Snoopy stuffed toys are popular all over the world. 
a huge industry has grown from a simple comic strip. Perhaps this means that while we all secretly want to be winners, we really identify more closely with the Charlie Browns of this world. Conquering Lake Ontario. In 490 BC, the Greek runner Philippides ran the 24 miles from Marathon to Athens to announce the Athenian victory. His endurance was so much admired that runners ever since have attempted to run similar long marathon distances. In the 20th century, however, long-distance swimming has also attracted attention and admiration. To swim the English Channel or Juan de Fuca Strait between Vancouver Island and the mainland have become challenges for both male and female swimmers. In September 1954, some Canadian businessmen from Toronto offered veteran Californian champion Florence Chadwick ten thousand dollars if she could swim Lake Ontario. They felt sure that such a feat would attract large crowds. Chadwick had swum the English Channel in both directions. However, no one, neither man nor woman, had crossed Lake Ontario. It was a 32-mile swim through cold water and difficult currents. Two other women also decided to take up the challenge. One, Winnie Roach Lausler, had also swum the English Channel. The other was a 16-year-old girl named Marilyn Bell. The swimmers traveled to the mouth of the Niagara River on the south side of Lake Ontario. They would swim from Youngstown in the USA back to Toronto. Bad weather delayed the swim for several days. During the night of September 8th, the weather cleared and the swimmers entered the water before midnight. Guided by her coach's flashlight, Marilyn swam through the dark water and soon passed Chadwick, who was lifted from the water after swimming 12 miles. Lausler made it further, but she too eventually had to give up. Marilyn not only had to overcome her fears of the dark, but she was attacked during the night by blood-sucking lamprey eels. She was able to knock these off with her fist. As dawn approached, the winds and waves increased, and Marilyn's weariness mounted. Her coach, Gus Ryder, passed her some corn syrup on a stick, and later gave her liniment for her tired legs. He wrote messages on a blackboard to encourage her to keep going. Sometimes he tricked her into thinking that she was nearer to the shore than she was. Marilyn fell asleep in the water twice and had to be awakened. The second time, a friend of hers jumped into the water beside her. And swam with her for a distance, because Marilyn's strength was declining. She was being pushed off course by the currents. Although the direct route was 32 miles, Marilyn swam a total of 45 miles. The last few miles were extremely difficult. Marilyn's family and the lifeguards felt that she should be taken out of the water, but her coach threatened to quit as her coach if the swimmer gave up. It was getting dark again, and the swimmer was barely conscious as she approached the shore. Thousands of people lined the shore, hoping to touch her or get a picture of her. Marilyn's supporters had to push the crowds back so they wouldn't stop her from touching the shore. Finally, after 21 hours in the water, Marilyn reached land. The exhausted girl was rushed to an ambulance. She had lost about 20 pounds of her 120 pounds weight in the crossing. Finally, she was able to sleep. Huge crowds came out to see her the next day, and two days later, there was a parade in her honor through the streets of Toronto. Everyone admired the courage and endurance of the 16-year-old girl who became the first person to swim across Lake Ontario. Courier and Ives. Before the widespread use of photography, there was a large market for artistic depictions of scenes and events. A process for making prints called lithography became popular in North America during the early 19th century. One young artist who mastered this technique was Nathaniel Currier (1813 to 1888). Currier opened his own shop in 1834. Currier's success came when he issued prints of newsworthy events. His ruins of the Merchants' Exchange followed a great fire in New York, December 1834. One of Currier's prints of a disastrous fire on a steamboat was published in the New York Sun in 1840. There was also a large market for decorative prints. People who couldn't afford oil paintings would buy color prints to put on their walls. Some of these prints were copies of paintings. Sometimes Currier mentioned his source, and sometimes not. In 1852, James Merritt Ives (1824 to 1895) joined Currier's firm. In 1857, he became Currier's partner. After that, the firm was known as Currier and Ives. Altogether, the firm produced about 7,000 different subjects. Small prints sold for about 25 cents, and large color prints for about three dollars. 
Traveling salesmen went from house to house selling them. Courier and Ives sometimes hired the original painters to make the print. More often, someone from their own studio either composed an original subject or copied an existing painting or drawing. Contemporary news remained popular. Courier and Ives prints included the first appearance of Jenny Lind in America, 1850, the fall of Richmond, Virginia, 1865, and the Great Fire at Chicago, 1871. A common subject was a patriotic scene from American history. Interesting occupations such as whaling, bird hunting, trapping, fur trading, and deep sea fishing were portrayed. Pioneer and Indian topics were in demand. However, the most popular of all scenes were winter and holiday prints of ordinary people enjoying life: farm scenes, buggy rides, sleigh rides, market scenes, blacksmith shops, and town scenes sold well. Favorite prints included American Forest Scene, Maple Sugaring, 1860; Home to Thanksgiving, 1863; Winter in the Country, 1862; Life in the Country, The Morning Ride, 1859; and American Winter Sports, 1856. These scenes are still popular. Even today, you can buy Christmas cards with Courier and Ives winter scenes. This collection of prints gives a remarkable picture of America between 1934 and 1907. Although the prints are sometimes more romantic than reality, they give a lot of information about everyday life. They depict styles of clothing, trains and boats, buildings and bridges, and popular activities. They also tell us what sorts of scenes people at that time liked and what their artistic tastes were. Eventually, advances in photography made this kind of printmaking obsolete. In 1906, the firm of Courier and Ives closed its doors. For a while, these prints were not considered very valuable. Nowadays, however, there are many collectors, and Courier and Ives prints once again can be found decorating North American homes. Ebenezer Scrooge. In the story A Christmas Carol, Scrooge is an English businessman who thinks about nothing but money. He has no friends and spends no time with his family. He lives alone, eats alone. And works alone, except for his underpaid clerk Bob Cratchit. Scrooge never spends his money, but hoards it all and prides himself on his frugality. Scrooge hates Christmas. It's all nonsense to him. People spend money on food and gifts and parties. Often they can't afford what they spend. Worse than that, they take a whole day off work and so lose a chance to make more money. Scrooge is angry that he has to give his clerk the day off with pay. He feels that he's being robbed. Christmas is also a time when people are asked to give money to help the poor. Scrooge is angry when two men come to his door asking for donations. Scrooge argues that he pays taxes, which support prisons and workhouses. It is not his business to worry about the problems of other people. Scrooge represents businessmen who see the bottom line as all that matters. Scrooge's partner Marley had died seven years earlier. He was like Scrooge in all respects. That evening, which is Christmas Eve, Scrooge is visited by Marley's ghost. Marley drags steel chains round about him, which contain keys, cash boxes, ledgers, purses, and deeds. These are the things that Marley cared about when he was alive. Marley is condemned in death to wander the world and tells Scrooge that the same fate is likely to happen to him. However, three spirits will visit Scrooge, and if Scrooge listens to them, he may escape this fate. The first spirit comes and takes Scrooge back to the early scenes of his own life. He sees himself being left behind at school while the other boys went home for the holidays. Then his little sister arrives to tell him he could go home too. Another scene was of a cheerful Christmas party when Scrooge was a young man. A third scene showed him with the girl he was planning to marry. She left him because he no longer cared about anything but money. The second spirit shows Scrooge what people are doing that very Christmas. He shows Scrooge the preparations that people, even poor people, are making to celebrate Christmas. They visit Bob Cratchit's tiny home. There, they see the family cooking their little Christmas dinner. Bob's son, Tiny Tim, has been weakened by disease and has to use a crutch to walk. The family is delighted with its meal, small as it is. They see other scenes of poor people, miners and sailors, celebrating Christmas. Finally, they visit Scrooge's nephew and view his Christmas party and its games. The third spirit was the spirit of Christmas yet to come, the future. This spirit does not talk, but points to scenes connected with Scrooge. They overhear some businessmen joking about someone who has recently died. 
Scrooge sees that he no longer occupies his usual place of business. The spirit then shows him two women who have stolen the bedclothes, curtains, and clothes off the dead man and taken them to a pawnbroker. The spirit takes Scrooge to the room where the dead man died. The only people who are happy about the death are a young couple who owed him money. The spirit then shows Scrooge the Cratchit's house where they're mourning the death of Tiny Tim. Finally, the spirit takes him to a churchyard where they stand among the graves. Then the spirit points to the name of the dead man on the tombstone, Ebenezer Scrooge. Scrooge is going to die, and no one will care. Scrooge finds himself in his own bed on Christmas morning. He is resolved now to avoid the fate that the spirits had shown him. He is delighted that he's getting a second chance. Scrooge decides to surprise all his acquaintances, and he begins by buying a huge goose and sending it to the Cratchits. On his walk, he meets the two men collecting for the poor and offers them a large sum of money. He goes on to join his nephew at a Christmas party. The next day, when Bob Cratchit comes into work, Scrooge gives him a raise in his salary. He also takes care of Tiny Tim so that Tim recovers his health. Charles Dickens' story was written at a time when governments did very little to help the poor. Wages were very low, and many businessmen were unwilling to look after their workers properly. Dickens points out that people like Scrooge not only make other people unhappy, but also are usually unhappy themselves. It is possible to be a very rich businessman and a poor human being at the same time. Etiquette. Etiquette is a French word. The original meaning was little tickets. These tickets were given to people who were attending a public ceremony. Printed on the ticket were instructions about how to behave on this occasion. So etiquette came to mean the way to behave on public occasions. Etiquette today includes how to introduce people, how to eat properly, how to dress for different occasions, how to speak to different people, and what to do on special occasions. Almost every part of social life can have its particular etiquette. Sometimes etiquette changes or seems to change. There was much behavior attached to courtship, such as a man holding the door open for a woman. Nowadays, some people find this outdated, but politeness is always a good idea. It is nice to hold the door open for the next person, whoever they are. In fact, it sometimes seems like contemporary life encourages bad manners. Etiquette is no longer taught to young people. Moreover, in a youth culture, young people take their examples from other young people. As a result, good manners aren't considered important. The point of etiquette is to help people to get along with each other. If people behave in an accepted manner, there is less chance of misunderstanding. It is important for people to think about treating other people well. If everyone does what they feel like doing, it doesn't seem like they respect other people. Etiquette can help things to go a lot smoother. Manners vary from culture to culture, but the intention is the same: to treat people with consideration. This is a way to reduce conflict. Sometimes we can understand where these customs come from. Originally, shaking hands with your right hand probably meant that you weren't carrying a weapon. Taking off your hat may originally have been taking off your helmet. This meant that you weren't going to fight. Nowadays, there are new areas of social life. For example, a lot of conversation now takes place on the telephone. Perhaps because there is no traditional telephone etiquette, some people feel free to be rude. Try to treat the person on the phone just the way you would treat them if you were actually talking to them. Most people feel it is rude to interrupt a conversation, but many people seem to think that it is okay to interrupt someone talking on the phone. Children especially need to be taught not to interrupt. The internet also needs its own etiquette or netiquette, because you cannot see whom you are talking to, and they may be thousands of miles away. It is easy to misunderstand. Also, people cannot hear the tone of your voice over the internet. For this reason, some people use smileys, little faces, to show how they are feeling. If they make a joke, they can use a smiling face or print grin after their remark. This tips off the recipient that their remark is not to be taken seriously. Using simple words like please and thank you can make everyday life a lot smoother and happier. Like a lot of other things, we do not realize the importance of etiquette. Until it starts to disappear. Sunday morning at church. Every Sunday is a holiday or half holiday in North America. Some stores may be open, but banks, offices, and government services are usually closed. Sunday closing has a Christian origin. 
Christians believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead on a Sunday morning, so Sunday is known as the Lord's Day. About 30 or 35 percent of North Americans attend church regularly on Sunday mornings. About the same percentage attend church occasionally. At Christmas and Easter, the churches are very full as people celebrate these two important holy days. Nearly everybody goes to church at least three times. They are baptized or dedicated as a child. Most people are married in a church, and many people are buried after a church service. Church services are usually held Sunday mornings, often at 11 o'clock a.m., although there may also be evening services provided. Most services last an hour. Their purpose is to worship God and to help people focus on religious and moral beliefs. The service is led by a pastor, minister, or priest, who usually also looks after the people and the business of the church. It is the pastor who delivers the sermon, a 20-minute talk on a religious or moral matter. Usually members take part in the service. They may lead the singing, read from the Bible, offer prayers for the congregation, take up the collection, or act as ushers. Most churches also have a choir, a group of singers who lead in singing the hymns. There are many cultural traditions connected to going to church. People normally wear their best clothing and try to be on their best behavior. Talking or making noise in church is usually considered bad. This is why children often have a separate children's church or Sunday school, where they can be more like children. The Sunday service is the main weekly event at many churches. But nowadays, there are a growing number of large super churches which organize all kinds of activities for their members. These churches usually have large buildings and a large staff to plan and lead various activities. These might include prayer group, counseling and social work, youth programs, social action, fundraising events, etc. Many large churches have gymnasiums for regular sports activities. At the same time, house churches are also becoming very popular. These are small groups of people who meet at private homes. Sometimes a group will meet in a house until they have the money to buy a church. But many people say they prefer to meet in small groups. That way they get to know one another better. Then they feel comfortable sharing their problems and successes and praying for each other. Some say that large churches can interfere with getting close to God and other Christians. There are many different brands of Christianity. The largest single denomination in North America is Roman Catholicism. One large Christian brands are Episcopalian, Methodist, Baptist, Pentecostal, Lutheran, and Presbyterian. All have slightly different traditions and beliefs. Although in the past these groups have often been in conflict with one another, today they usually cooperate in working together for their members and the community. Thanksgiving Day Thanksgiving Day has a special meaning for Americans. Many holidays were brought along from Europe by the early settlers and didn't change very much. But Thanksgiving takes on a special shape in North America. That is because of the Thanksgiving celebrated by the early pilgrim settlers in Massachusetts in 1621. These early settlers were from England, and they were known as Puritans. This is because they wanted to purify the state religion of England. They felt that the churches were more concerned with politics and customs than God and worship. They were also called pilgrims because they were willing to travel to other countries in order to worship God the way they wanted to. When the English government put some of the pilgrims in jail, the rest left England and went to the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, they could have their own churches. However, it was hard to earn a living there, and at first they didn't know the language. In time, the English king learned where they were and tried to have them arrested, so they thought of another plan. Pilgrim leaders like William Brewster attempted to raise money to start a colony in North America. They would have to borrow money and pay it back later. Thirty members of the Pilgrim Church in the Netherlands voted to sail to America with their families. They returned to England and set sail on two ships, the Speedwell and the Mayflower. When the Speedwell appeared unable to cross the ocean, both ships returned to England. All who still wanted to sail crowded into the Mayflower and set sail on September 6, 1620. Many of the passengers became sick during the long voyage, and some died. They encountered fierce storms because they were sailing late in the season. After 66 days, they sighted the sandy shoreline of Cape Cod in present-day Massachusetts. There was disagreement between the pilgrims and others on board ship about what to do. So first, they had to agree to a common form of a government and elect a governor. Since winter was coming, they decided to stay on the ship till spring. About half of the remaining settlers died during the first winter. When the Mayflower sailed back to England, only about 50 settlers were left. Nearly half of these were children. 
There were Indians in Massachusetts, but at first they were not friendly. They shot arrows at the settlers. But one day, a friendly Indian named Samoset came to visit them. He spoke English and could tell them many things. He brought another Indian named Squanto, who showed the pilgrims how to plant corn. Eventually, their chief Massasoit came, and he promised to keep peaceful relations with the settlers. All spring and summer of 1621, the pilgrims worked hard in the fields. They also finished building houses and barns. In the fall, they were delighted to see that the corn and vegetables had grown well. They decided to have a Thanksgiving feast and invited their Indian friends. On the day of the feast, Chief Massasoit came with ninety Indians. There were turkeys, deer meat, and fish to eat. The feast lasted three days. When the food ran low, the Indians went out to shoot more birds and animals. The pilgrims and Indians competed in races, wrestling, shooting, and other games. The pilgrims addressed prayers and thanks to God for providing food, shelter, freedom of religion, and friendly Indians in this new land. Ever since 1621, Thanksgiving celebrations include memories of that special occasion. Today, turkeys, cranberries, corn, and squash are usually part of the Thanksgiving meal. In the United States, Thanksgiving Day is a national holiday. It's celebrated every year on the fourth Thursday in November. In Canada, where the harvest is earlier, Thanksgiving is celebrated on the second Monday of October. The celebration always includes giving thanks for the good things that people have received, especially for food and families. Along with this goes the Thanksgiving meal, when so many good things are eaten. The Great Walls of China. The Great Wall of China is famous in North America, and many tourists would like to travel there. However, most North Americans don't know very much about Chinese history. That is changing now, as China is becoming an important subject for study in the West. The settled communities of China were targets for nomadic raids since earliest times. For much of its early history, China was not fully unified. However, Shi Huang, who died in 210 BC, united the whole country. Then he set about defending China from the northern nomads. It seems likely there have been defensive walls in the north before. However, Shi Huang had a wall constructed across the entire north of China. This defensive wall extended for almost 2,000 miles and had 25,000 towers. Such walls were very expensive to build. They also required huge numbers of men to construct them and later to defend them. Even so, the Great Wall did not stop nomadic invasions altogether. Not long after Shi Huang's death, a tribe called the Huns crossed the wall. The emperor Hu Ti, who expanded Chinese power beyond the wall, defeated them. Centuries later, the Mongols to the north of China were united under Genghis Khan. The Mongols attacked China, and Kublai Khan, grandson of Genghis, became the first non-Chinese emperor of China in 1279. Eventually, the Chinese rebelled and overthrew their Mongol rulers. Nonetheless, the Mongols remained a threat. In 1449, they destroyed a Chinese army and captured the emperor. A new Great Wall was begun to keep the Mongols out. This is the wall which tourists visit today and which is pictured on Chinese stamps. Construction continued for 200 years. While some parts were built of packed earth, much of the wall was built of stone, brick, and rubble. This is why it took so long. Stones had to be quarried and bricks baked and carried to the site. Laborers, peasants, soldiers, and criminals were forced to work on the wall. Large and small forts and watchtowers carefully guarded the wall. Nearly a million soldiers were stationed along it. The Chinese defenders lit fires when the enemy was sighted. Plumes of smoke and cannon shots told that the enemy was advancing and how many there were. By 1644, the new wall was almost completed. That same year, however, an internal uprising overthrew the emperor. This revolt was partly caused by the high taxes demanded to pay for the wall. The emperor's men invited the nomadic Manchu tribe to come through the gates in the wall to help put down the revolt. The Manchus came, but they stayed and ruled China for several hundred years. Since the Manchus ruled both north and south of the wall, they did not care about maintaining it. Many parts fell into disrepair, and some completely disappeared. Today, the parts that remain are a major tourist attraction. The Great Wall of China is one of the wonders of the world, even if it really didn't succeed in its purpose of keeping the northern nomads out of China. Charlotte Church. Many years ago, a German opera impresario was asked why so many of his leading ladies were physically unattractive. He replied, "The ones who look like horses sing like nightingales, and vice versa. Certainly, a good voice doesn't always go with an attractive appearance, but in our day of media images, good looks seem very important." 
Charlotte Church recorded her first album when she was 12 years old. It was called "Voice of an Angel." Everyone agreed that the little girl has a very big voice, and they were delighted that Charlotte not only sounded like an angel, she also looked like one. Her sweet schoolgirl appearance and winning smile are part of her success. Charlotte Church was born in Cardiff, Wales, in February 1986. Music and singing are very important in Welsh culture, and all of Charlotte's family were musical. Although Wales is part of Great Britain, the Welsh people are very proud of their own language, history, and heritage. Now that Wales has its own parliament in Cardiff, Welsh culture is promoted even more strongly. Charlotte sings some of her songs in the Welsh language. Charlotte began singing along with the radio as an infant, and by the age of three, she could sing a number of popular songs. She began singing lessons when she was nine. Charlotte first appeared on television early in 1997. This led to a number of other TV and concert appearances. In 1998, she signed a contract with Sony to record five albums. Since Charlotte's first album appeared, she has spent a lot of time doing promotional tours. Since she's a schoolgirl, her two tutors travel along with her. Voice of an Angel was recorded in five days in Cardiff, Wales. All the songs were ones that Charlotte already knew and liked. These included Pie Jesus, The Lord's Prayer, Jerusalem, and Danny Boy. The album came out on November nine, nineteen ninety eight, and within a couple of weeks was number four on the popular music charts. She recorded her second album, Charlotte Church, in nineteen ninety nine. Traveling involves doing showcases for people in the music industry and the media. This is to encourage people to promote your music. Charlotte also appeared on various U.S. talk shows, including David Letterman and Jay Leno. She finds that she gets asked the same questions over and over again. Besides media celebrities, Charlotte has met many leading public figures. Since she is a Roman Catholic, Charlotte was especially excited to meet the Pope. This was after she'd been invited to sing at a Christmas concert at the Vatican. She was also asked to sing at Prince Charles' 50th birthday party in 1998. She saw the prince again in 1999 when she sang at the official opening of the Welsh National Assembly. Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip talked to her too. Later that year, she sang for Bill and Hillary Clinton at the Ford Theater in Washington. Something that people like about Charlotte Church is that when she hasn't been spoiled by fame, many show business kids are loud, brash, noisy, and rude. But when she is away from the stage, the young singer leads a normal life with her family and friends. Even when she is on TV, she comes across as an ordinary teenager, but a very nice one. Charlotte's voice always gets comments. It seems like such a big voice for a little girl. Very few teenagers have a powerful operatic voice like hers. Some people have found it hard to believe that it is actually Charlotte singing. For the most part, she enjoys her success. She likes to travel and meet new people. Los Angeles is her favorite city, and she likes the United States and Canada. But she is always glad to get home to Wales and be with her friends. At the moment, she goes to an all-girls school, so she doesn't see boys very often. But at age 15, an interest in boys is likely to become a factor in her life. Charlotte now has recorded three albums, and we can expect a fourth in 2001. She also has written an account of her life for all her fans. It is entitled "Voice of an Angel: My Life So Far." The Planetarium. All around the world, stargazing is a popular activity. The night sky lit up with stars is one of the most impressive scenes in nature. Besides its natural beauty, people study the night sky for many reasons. Some believe that they can read the future in the stars. Others think that the stars influence the weather, while some people worship the stars and the planets. There is a problem with stargazing. If the night is cloudy, people on the ground cannot see the stars. Also, bad weather makes being outside at night uncomfortable. Besides, not everybody wants to stay up late at night. A planetarium is an ideal solution to all these problems. A planetarium is usually a large dome-covered building. It has seating like a theater. The program here is a star show. A special projector throws a picture of the night sky on the ceiling of the planetarium theater. Like a movie projector, the planetarium projector can show a constantly changing program. It can show how the stars look right now, how they looked thousands of years ago, and how they will look in the future.
Planetariums can be both entertaining and educational. School children can go to learn about the nine planets of the solar system or about the various groupings of stars. Planetarians can teach you how to find the stars and planets yourself when you're out at night. There can also be dramatic showings about changes to the universe over time. This is also a way to view special phenomena like Halley's Comet, which only appears once in a lifetime. Planetarians can also show how ancient people view the skies. Shepherds living out under the sky imagine that groups of stars represented wonderful people and huge animals. Stories were told about these constellations. Sometimes the story explained how the people or animals became stars. For example, why Orion, the mighty hunter, is chasing Taurus the bull. Planetarians can project these figures on their screen. They can also speed up changes in the heavens. It takes about 28 days for the moon to travel through all its phases. Changes in the moon or in the sun can be shown easily. Planetarians can also show the sky the way it appears in another part of the world, or the way it appeared on a famous historical occasion. Special heavenly phenomena, such as a meteor shower, can also be demonstrated. Things that appear only rarely in the real sky can be shown every night. A planetarian is usually concerned to put into special programs to keep its audience coming back. Since the heavens are always moving and changing, there is no shortage of ideas for programmers. Alexander Graham Bell. The Victorian period was a time of many new inventions. Earlier discoveries, such as the steam engine, the screw propeller, the power of electricity, and the possibility of sending messages along a wire, were now applied to everyday life. Inventors such as Thomas Edison and Nikola Tesla explored new methods for harnessing electric power. Some of the greatest discoveries were made by Alexander Graham Bell. Bell was born in Scotland in 1847. Both his father and grandmother taught speech methods and worked with deaf and dumb children. Alexander was also interested in this work, especially as his mother was almost deaf. Alexander's two brothers died of tuberculosis, and he himself contracted the disease. So his parents decided to leave Scotland for a drier, healthier climate. They moved to Bradford, Ontario, Canada, and lived in a roomy, comfortable house overlooking the Grand River. Today, the Bell Homestead is an historical museum that attracts visitors from all over the world. At that time, Canada did not have a lot of business opportunities, so Alexander found a job teaching speech in Boston, USA. But he returned to Brantford every summer. In Boston, Bell married one of his deaf students. His father-in-law suggested that there were good business opportunities in inventing communication devices. Bell soon developed a method for sending more than one telegraph message at the same time. While working on improving the telegraph, Bell and his assistant Thomas Watson found a way to send the human voice over wires. On August 10, 1876, Bell sent the first telephone message over wires strung between Brantford and Paris, Ontario, eight miles away. The telephone caused an international sensation, with government leaders asking to have one. But Bell didn't stop there. He worked on the recording properties of wax cylinders and other approaches to flat phonograph records. He also developed the photophone, which later led to the development of the motion picture soundtrack. Bell worked on these inventions at his laboratory in Washington, D.C. But he didn't like the hot, humid summer weather there, so Bell began looking for a new place to spend his summers. He decided to build a summer home in Cape Breton Island, Nova Scotia. The island reminded Bell of his native Scotland. Now he had space during the summer to do experiments outside. He soon began to experiment with flying machines. Bell designed and tested huge kites, hoping to come up with a frame for a flying machine. Along with some enthusiastic friends, Bell also experimented with airplanes. On February 23, 1909, one of these planes flew through the air for a half a mile. This was the first airplane flight in the British Empire. The Alexander Graham Bell Museum in Baddock, Nova Scotia, displays many of these inventions. Bell was also interested in making a faster boat. Since much of a boat stays under water, the water resistance slows the boat down. Bell thought that if you could raise the boat out of the water, it would go much faster. Working on Cape Breton Island, Bell and his friends developed the hydrofoil, a boat that would skim the surface of the water at high speeds. Hydrofoils are in use in many places today. Every time people use the telephone, listen to a recording, watch a movie or television, or ride on a hydrofoil, they owe a debt to that greatest. Inventor Alexander Graham Bell. The story of Anne Frank.
War, persecution, and economic depression affect not only adults, but also old people, children, babies, the sick, and the handicapped. Since history is written mostly about politicians, soldiers, intellectuals, and criminals, we don't read very often about how events affect ordinary people. Now and then, a special book will shed light on what it was like to live in the midst of terrible events. Such a book is the diary of Anne Frank. Anne Frank was born in Frankfurt am Main, Germany, in 1929. Her father, Otto Frank, was a businessman who moved the family to the Netherlands in 1934. In Amsterdam, Otto started a company selling pectin to make jams and jellies. Later, he began a second company that sold herbs for seasoning meat. Otto Frank had decided to leave Germany because of the policies and personality of the new German Chancellor Adolf Hitler. Hitler had a personal hatred, not only for Jewish people, but also for everything Jewish. He felt that one way to strengthen Germany and solve its problems was to kill or drive out all the Jews. Hitler also felt that other groups, such as blacks, gypsies, the handicapped, homosexuals, and a chronically unemployed should be eliminated. Then only strong, healthy, true Germans would be left. Since Hitler had a plan to solve Germany's economic problems, he received a lot of popular support. Very few Germans realized that he was mentally and emotionally unbalanced and would kill anyone who got in his way. The Frank family was Jewish, and they felt that they would be safe in the Netherlands. However, in May 1940, Germany invaded the Netherlands and soon took over the government. In 1941, laws were passed to keep Jews separate from other Dutch citizens. The following year, Dutch Jews began to be shipped to concentration camps in Germany and Poland. Just before this began, Anne Frank, Otto's younger daughter, received a diary for her 13th birthday. Less than a month later, the whole family went into hiding. Otto Frank had made friends with the Dutch people who worked with him in his business operations. Now these friends were ready to help him, even though hiding Jews from the authorities was treated as a serious crime. Behind Otto Frank's business offices, there was another house that was not visible from the street. Here the Franks moved many of their things. Only a few trusted people knew they were living there. The Franks moved into these small rooms on July 6, 1942, and they lived there with another Jewish family, the Van Pels, until the police captured them on August 4, 1944. So, for more than two years, the two families never went outside. All their food and supplies had to be brought to them. During this period, Anne Frank told her diary all of her thoughts and fears. Like any teenage girl, she hoped that good things would happen to her, that she would become a writer or a movie star. She complained that her parents treated her like a child. She insisted that she was grown up. She also talked about how difficult it was to live in a small area with seven other people and not to be able to go outside. She wrote about the war and hoped the Netherlands would soon be liberated from the Germans. Anne sometimes envied her older sister Margot, who was so much more mature and who never got into trouble. She and Margot wrote letters to each other to pass the time, and even had a romance with Peter Van Pels, who was 17. Then all their fears came true. All the eight Jews hiding in the house were arrested and eventually sent to Auschwitz death camp in Poland. Although the war was ending, it did not end soon enough for the Frank family. Only Otto Frank survived the war. One of their helpers, Miep Gies, Saved Anne's diary and kept it. After the war, Otto Frank decided to publish it. Since 1947, more than 20 million copies had been sold in 55 languages. Anne's diary shows the terrible cost of hatred, persecution, and war better than any history book. Christmas holidays. In many ways, Christmas is the most important holiday in North America. It is the most important commercial festival. Most retail stores do half their annual business in the six weeks or so before Christmas. Christmas is an important holiday from work and school. Many workers take the whole week off between Christmas and New Year's Day. It is the biggest time of the year for parties, gift giving, home decorations, and visiting. Many homeowners compete to see who can have the best display of lights. It is also an important time for the entertainment industry. Many Christmas movies, TV shows, recordings, concerts, and plays are produced every year for the Christmas season. It is also the time of year when the largest number of people attend church because Christmas is a religious festival too. It celebrates the birth of Jesus. How all these different things came together to become Christmas is a long story. Why, for example, is Jesus' birthday celebrated on December 25th? No one knows the exact day that Jesus was born, but Jesus was born during the Roman Empire, and for the Romans, December 25th was a very important day.
The Romans had many gods and many religions. Two religions, both of which had one main god, were the worship of the invincible sun and Mithras. These gods were both honored on December 25th. Because December 25th was just after the shortest day of the year, it was a natural time to worship the sun. December was also a time to celebrate the end of the agriculture year. The Romans held one of their main festivals, the Saturnalia, beginning on December 17th. That lasted for a week. The Romans also began the custom of celebrating New Year's Day on January 1st. So the last half of December and the beginning of January was a wonderful time for partying and games. The early Christians didn't know what day Jesus was born. At first, they celebrated his birthday on January 6th. However, as most people in the Roman Empire were becoming Christians, it was decided to move the date to December 25th. The celebration lasted 12 days until January 6th and took the place of all other festivals. That way, people who were used to celebrating on December 25th would feel more comfortable. As different peoples became Christian, they brought their own customs to be part of Christmas. The people of Northern Europe used evergreen trees and mistletoe as symbols of spring and eternal life. The evergreen tree became the Christmas tree. The mistletoe is hung from the ceiling at Christmas for couples to kiss under. It was also in Northern Europe where the idea of Santa Claus or Father Christmas began. In Roman times, there was a man who became known as Saint Nicholas. He is said to have given gifts to the poor and provided dowries for poor girls who wouldn't otherwise be able to marry. The idea of the gift-giving saint became joined with the northern idea of spirit of Christmas festivities. It was a poem written in 1831 by the American writer Clement Moore, which popularized Santa Claus throughout the world. Twas the night before Christmas. Told the story of how Santa visits every house in the world on Christmas Eve and brings toys for good girls and boys. Since that time, parents have secretly bought toys for their children at Christmas. When the children awake on Christmas Day, they find toys by the chimney or under the Christmas tree. They are told that Santa Claus and his reindeer brought them. Adults also give gifts to each other at Christmas time. No wonder that the stores sell so many things. Then, it is often said that Christmas is becoming too commercialized. In the rush to get everything ready, to buy the gifts, decorate the house and tree, give parties, visit family and friends, and attend special Christmas events, the original reason for celebrating is sometimes forgotten. Only when people go to church or sing Christmas carols or attend musical performances about Jesus' birth. Do they remember that Christmas is the birthday of Christ? Garage sales and yard sales. Every Saturday morning in our part of the world, except in winter, many people drive around the city looking for yard sales. Yard sales or garage sales often take place in the driveway of someone's home or perhaps the front lawn. The homeowners take out all the stuff they don't want and arrange it in front of their house. Usually, they put a price tag on items. People driving by will stop to see if there's anything they want. Many people spend every Saturday morning shopping at yard sales. If they find that they have bought too many things, then they have a yard sale of their own. Some of the shoppers are dealers who buy things for resale. Sometimes they resell them at their own yard sales, but some dealers are professionals who run antique stores, used bookshops, flea markets, or used furniture and appliance stores. Usually, the dealers will try to get to the yard sale before anyone else. That way, they have the best selection. Often, they'll try to buy items for less than what the price tag says. The cheaper they can buy the item, the more profit they can make when they resell it. Their motto is: Buy low, sell high. Sometimes a merchant will boast that he paid one dollar for a glass or china cup at a yard sale and sold it for a hundred dollars at his store or on the internet. By having catalogs that show the value of collectibles, dealers can sometimes make large profits. Now, however, many of the people having yard sales will try to check the value of the things they are selling first, so it is getting harder to get a real bargain. One reason for yard sales is that North Americans often live in big houses, which fill up with things. People may use the basement, the attic, the spare room, and the garage to store things that they aren't using. If they store things in their garage, all they have to do is open the garage door and have a garage sale. When children grow up and move away, the parents will often sell the children's old clothes, toys, and furniture. Another reason for yard sales is that there are a lot of things that people might like but don't want to pay full price for. 
For example, if someone likes to read novels, they may be happy to pay one dollar for a book at a yard sale rather than twenty or thirty dollars at a retail store. What sorts of things are sold at yard sales? Just about anything you might find in a house or yard. There are ornaments, china, home decorations, sports equipment, bicycles, games, dolls, toys, tables, and chairs, lamps, appliances, books, records, paintings, clothes, record players, and much, much more. Some items are things that were popular a few years ago, but now have gone out of fashion. This might include many toys, books, and games that relate to an old television show that is no longer being shown. While a lot of older people go to yard sales, so do a lot of students. Students and young people may need cheap furniture for their apartment or a bicycle to get to school or work. They may not be able to pay full price. If you are lucky, you can find almost anything at a yard sale. The trick is to get there early. Most yard sales are advertised to start at 9 a.m., but dealers may arrive as early as 7:30 a.m. By 10 a.m., the busiest part is already over. Although most yard sales go on into the afternoon, yard sales tend to prove the common saying that one person's trash is another person's treasure. Helen Keller. What would it be like to be unable to see anything, hear anything, or say anything? Life for young Helen Keller was like that. She had an illness before she was two years old that had left her deaf, dumb, and blind. After that, it was difficult for her to communicate with anyone. She could only learn by feeling with her hands. This was very frustrating for Helen, her mother, and her father. Helen Keller grew up in Alabama, USA, during the 1880s and 1890s. At that time, people who had lost the use of their eyes, ears, and mouth often ended up in charitable institutions. Such a place would provide them with basic food and shelter until they died, or they could go out on the street with a beggar's bowl and ask strangers for money. Since Helen's parents were not poor, she did not have to do either of these things. But her parents knew they would have to do something to help her. One day, when she was six years old, Helen became frustrated that her mother was spending so much time with a new baby. Unable to express her anger, Helen tipped over the baby's crib, nearly injuring the baby. Her parents were horrified and decided to take the last chance open to them. They would try to find someone to teach Helen to communicate. A new school in Boston claimed to be able to teach children like Helen. The Kellers wrote a letter to the school in Boston asking for help. In March of 1887, a teacher, 20-year-old Ann Sullivan, arrived at the Kellers' home in Tuscumbia, Alabama. Ann Sullivan herself had a very difficult life. Her mother had died when she was eight. Two years later, their father had abandoned Ann and their little brother Jimmy. Ann was nearly blind, and her brother had a diseased hip. No one wanted the two handicapped children, so they were sent to a charitable institution. Jimmy died there. At age fourteen, Ann, who was not quite blind, was sent to a school for the blind in Boston. Since she had not had any schooling before, she had to start in grade one. Then she had an operation that gave back some of her eyesight. Since Ann knew what it was like to be blind, she was a sympathetic teacher. Before Ann could teach Helen anything, she had to get her attention. Because Helen was so hard to communicate with, she was often left alone to do as she pleased. A few days after she arrived, Anne insisted that Helen learn to sit down at the table and eat breakfast properly. Anne told the Kellers to leave, and she spent all morning in the breakfast room with Helen. Finally, after a difficult struggle, she got the little girl to sit at the table and use a knife and fork. Since the Keller family did not like to be strict with Helen, Anne decided that she needed to be alone with her for a while. There was a little cottage away from the big house. The teacher and pupil moved there for some weeks. It was here that Anne taught Helen the manual alphabet. This was a system of sign language. But since Helen couldn't see, Anne had to make the signs in her hands so she could feel them. For a long time, Helen had no idea what the words she was learning meant. She learned words like box and cat, but hadn't learned that they referred to those objects. One day, Anne dragged Helen to a water pump and made the signs for water, while she pumped water over Helen's hands. Helen at last made the connection between the signs and the thing. Water was that cool, wet liquid stuff. Once Helen realized that the manual alphabet could be used to name things, she ran around naming everything. 
Before too long, she began to make sentences using the manual alphabet. She also learned to read and write using the square hand alphabet, which was made up of raised square letters. Before long, she was also using Braille and beginning to read books. Helen eventually learned to speak a little, although this was hard for her because she couldn't hear herself. She went on to school and then to Radcliffe College. She wrote articles and books, gave lectures, and worked tirelessly to help the blind. The little girl who couldn't communicate with anyone became, in time, a wonderful communicator. Trial by jury. If you are a citizen of Canada or the United States, it is very likely that you will be summoned at some time for jury duty. A letter will come in the mail telling you to report to a certain place at a given time. There are legal penalties for not attending because jury duty is considered every citizen's responsibility. Often, a large number of people, perhaps several hundred, will be summoned at one time. When you arrive, you will join a lineup of others who are registering for duty. Eventually, you will get to a table and talk to an official. If you have a special reason for not being a juror, such as ill health, you may be excused at this point. Those not immediately exempted will become a part of a jury panel. Out of this panel, a number of juries of twelve people will be chosen. These will decide a variety of criminal cases over the next few weeks. What follows is the experience of one woman in a jury pool. She went ahead with others into a large courtroom where they spent the whole day. At the front of the courtroom were the judge and the lawyers for the prosecution and for the defense. One of the lawyers explained what the case was going to be about. The names of the jury panel were in a box at the front. When someone's name was called, they went up to the front of the courtroom. The person called up would then have a chance to explain why they couldn't serve as a juror if there was some reason preventing them. For example, one woman was dismissed because she knew the accused. The first jury to be chosen was for a burglary case. A panel member went forward and faced the accused. Then the lawyers in the trial decided whether the juror was satisfactory to them. At lunchtime, the panel was dismissed for an hour. The second jury was to try someone on a charge of murder. Usually, the panel was told approximately how long the trial might be. Since jurors are not usually paid, many would like to avoid being involved in a long trial. The woman was called forward and had to look the man accused of murder in the eye. This made her quite nervous. Judging by her expression, the two lawyers would decide whether they wanted her on the jury or not. The defense lawyer would try to choose someone who seemed sympathetic to the man accused. The prosecutor would prefer someone who was not sympathetic. The woman excused herself by saying she had a very young child to look after and no relatives to help. She was allowed to go home at the end of the day. Some people wonder whether it is fair for lawyers to dismiss jurors who may not be sympathetic in their cases. For example, defense lawyers may try to choose young people if they think these will be less severe to their clients. In the case above, the lawyers seem to prefer women to men. This means that a lot of people are dismissed from being jurors without a good reason. One principle of the jury system, however, is to protect the rights of the accused particularly well. One might say that the jury system is biased in favor of the defendant. This is why defense lawyers have an opportunity to dismiss people who they think will not be favorable to their clients. Furthermore, having 12 jurors gives the defense a good opportunity for a successful defense. If the defense attorney can raise a reasonable doubt about the guilt of his client in even one juror, then the accused has a chance of being released. This happened in the O.J. Simpson murder trial. There, even though there was strong evidence that Simpson committed the crime, the defense was able to insinuate some doubts among the jurors. Moreover, the defense lawyers may be able to appeal to the emotions of the jurors. Particularly if they can think of a way to gain sympathy for their client. For this reason, defense lawyers are more likely to choose trial by jury over trial by judge alone. A judge is less likely to be swayed by emotion than a jury, and a defense attorney may also prefer a criminal trial to a civil suit. In the latter case, the client does not have to be proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, but will be found liable if the preponderance of evidence is against him or her. This is why O.J. Simpson was acquitted on criminal charges, but then found liable for damages in a civil suit. A favorite place. It is good to have a favorite place where you can go to be alone and relax. Sometimes this spot is your own room or a quiet part of the house. 
Sometimes it is somewhere outdoors, away from people and busy streets. Or you may feel most comfortable in a shopping mall or a downtown park. Our favorite place is especially nice to go at times of stress. When work gets too hectic or we have trouble with other people, then our favorite place is a refuge from these difficulties. My special spot is very close to where I work. It is on a busy university campus. At one end of the university, hidden among several buildings, there is a pond. This pond is surrounded by large rocks, which rise up like a small cliff on one side. Shooting out of these rocks are water pipes, which create a small waterfall. The water is drawn up from the bottom of the pond and drops back into the middle. This keeps the water from becoming stagnant. On the other side of the pond, there is a grassy shore and a flat stone patio. Here, in the summer, people can sit out and have meals. Yet, very few people come here to sit, perhaps because they are very busy with their work. There is something very calm and pleasant about trees and grass and shade, about birds singing and water rippling, and flowers blooming all around. Green is a relaxing color for the eyes. Still water suggests peace. Running water seems full of life. There is a large weeping willow tree on the grassy side of the pond. Its branches touch the water and shade much of the pond. Rushes grow in the shallow water. The pond is only about three feet deep. In the summer, there are beautiful water lilies in bloom over much of the pond. Sometimes I have counted over thirty blooms, and some flowers are over five inches wide. Goldfish and minnows are the pond's chief inhabitants, but there are also crayfish and other animals. At different times, there have been a turtle, a water snake, and a family of ducks. Behind the pond is a large glassy wall, which reflects the entire scene. One can also go inside and view the pond, even on rainy or snowy days. There are several gardens close to the pond. One of the gardeners told me that he could turn the waterfall off and on. Usually on the weekends, it is turned off. But if there is a special event, the waterfall is left on. Behind the glassy wall is a cafeteria. Here, visitors to the university are sometimes taken for meals. The students do not use it. In the winter, the pond freezes over. Sometimes, if the winter is very cold, the pond freezes right down to the bottom. Then, most of the goldfish and minnows die. Usually, some survive in the mud at the bottom of the pond. Occasionally, people will skate on the pond if the ice is smooth. When spring comes, a lot of the old rushes and water lily leaves from the previous year are cleared away. This makes the pond more attractive and gives the new plants room to grow. If there are too many rushes, they are sometimes cut down in summer. Then visitors can see the water lilies better. Chances are that if you ever visit Brock University in St. Catharines, Ontario, you will hear about Pond Inlet. And if you come in the summer, you will probably see me there, thinking about my next article. Business ethics. What do business and ethics have to do with each other? Business is about making profits. Ethics is about right and wrong. How are they connected? Well. Business ethics is the study of right and wrong as applied to business actions. Some businessmen would say that there is no need for business ethics. If we don't break the laws of the country, we have nothing to worry about. However, we can do many bad things without breaking laws. In some countries, it would be legal for a businessman to pollute the land, sea, and air, to confine his workers to barracks, and to hire children to work in factories. But these things may not be right. On the other hand, it may be illegal for a businessman to do some good things. For example, his society may expect him to treat people unequally and discriminate against some ethnic or religious groups. In order to know what is right or wrong, we need a moral rule. This rule does not come from business itself, but from ethics. So we need a statement of what we believe to be right. The American Declaration of Independence in 1776 states an ethical principle: 
We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. The Declaration further tells us that all men have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Principles such as these can be used in American politics and law to decide whether an action is right or wrong. Many companies have their own ethical guidelines. IBM, for example, outlines its corporate ethics under headings such as tips, gifts, and entertainment, accurate reporting, fair competition, and not boasting. So each employee knows what to do or not to do in various situations. Ethical choices are made on three levels. Individuals, by companies and by societies, make them. An individual might choose whether or not to accept a bribe. A company might decide whether or not to bribe government officials. A government or society might decide whether or not to outlaw bribery. Similar principles of right and wrong might be used at all three levels. For example, it might be decided that bribery is simply wrong in all situations. On the other hand, it might be decided to view the situation case by case. In other words, there is a strong ethical stand and a more tentative ethical stand. The strong ethical stand applies when you have a basic moral principle and apply it to all situations. For example, you might believe that it was always wrong to let workers handle hazardous substances without any protection. The weaker stand would consider whether it is legal to do so. If it is legal to let workers handle dangerous materials, and this conforms to social expectations, then the weak ethical stand would say, no problem. As long as the law is not broken and no one strenuously objects, then everything is okay. However, in ethics, there is a principle called the moral minimum. This principle means that you should never harm another person knowingly. The only exception would be to protect some other people or yourself. So business ethics would say that the businessman who exposes his workers to hazardous chemicals is wrong. He is not practicing the moral minimum. Colonial Williamsburg Travelers in the desert or the jungle sometimes see the remains of old cities. These cities were once large and prosperous, but something has changed. Perhaps the climate got drier or wetter. Perhaps the trade routes, which had brought merchants to the city, now went elsewhere. Perhaps enemies destroyed them. Or perhaps disease or famine drove the people away. Other cities, which were once important, have become less so in time. Jamestown, Virginia, the first English colony in America, is now only an historic site. It began as the capital of Virginia, but when fire destroyed the government buildings in 1699, the capital was moved to nearby Williamsburg. Williamsburg was an important town for many years. The British governors lived there, and two of them worked on the plans for the town and its buildings. The College of William and Mary was established there in the 1690s the second oldest college in America. As the capital, Williamsburg contained many public buildings, including a courthouse, a jail, a powder magazine, the governor's palace, and the government building. Of course, there were many private houses as well. From 1699 until 1780, Williamsburg was the capital of Virginia. Many people came there for government and legal business. It was also a social center with dances, fairs, horse races, and auctions. The governor and his wife provided expensive dinners and entertainment for their guests. Most of the important people in Virginia owned tobacco plantations. In 1612, John Rolfe had first raised tobacco to sell to England. Soon, tobacco farming was Virginia's most important business. Most planters were able to build large houses and buy slaves to do their work. One plantation owner is said to have owned 300,000 acres of land and 1,000 black slaves, as well as having large amounts of money. The planters were the leaders of this colonial society, and they resented British interference in their local government. When England imposed taxes on the American colonists in 1765, it was a Virginian, Patrick Henry, who spoke against them. His words, Give me liberty or give me death, helped to inspire the American Revolution. 
as complaints about British rule increased, it was Virginians who led the rebels. George Washington became commander of the Revolutionary Army, and Thomas Jefferson drafted the Declaration of Independence in 1776. In 1780, the capital of Virginia was moved to Richmond. Williamsburg was now simply a small college town of local importance. Not much changed in Williamsburg for many years. In the 20th century, the Reverend Dr. Goodwin, who was the priest at the Williamsburg Church, had the idea of restoring Williamsburg to the way it appeared in colonial days. Goodwin approached John D. Rockefeller Jr. with his idea, and Rockefeller agreed to finance this project. Beginning in 1926, the old buildings of Williamsburg were restored to their original form. First were the college buildings, then the Rally Tavern, the government building, the governor's palace, and so on. Buildings that had been destroyed over time were reconstructed from plans and descriptions. Soon the restored buildings were open to the public. Guides, dressed in 18th century costumes, show visitors through the buildings and gardens. Visitors can also travel to nearby tobacco plantations. Now, tourists who pay admission to visit this wonderful historic town finance much of the work of restoration and conservation.